Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Galax RTX 3090 Hall of Fame PCB. And, uh, well, the Hall of Fame series doesn't really need any inter introductions, so uh, let's get right into it, I guess. And the the thir first thing I want to talk about um, is, is the output filtering on this card, because... Yeah, the VRM's really big and powerful, but we, we've got plenty of 3090s with plenty powerful, you know, V-Core and MSVDD and memory VRMs. And admittedly, this is probably the most powerful in everything except memory power, um, which is mostly because the memory, like, there's... We'll get to that. Um, but, like, the, the VRM differences between this card and a lot of the others aren't really that big. But what is very different <laughs> compared to most other 3090s uh, is even like the extreme overclocking 3090s is just the output filtering on this card. Like this, and I'm, I'm not sure that I'm actually highlighting it properly because it's really hard to tell what part of this belongs to what. Um, like I'm guessing that these caps over here are probably for memory and then this is all core power. But yeah, the like there's... The, the, the thing is, it's really hard to know, like, w what part exactly belongs to what, uh, what rail. Um, this should, this down here should be memory power. But the reason why I'm highlighting this is just, like, th this output filter is insane. <laughs> like, we've got a mishmash of, you know, SP caps and multi-layer ceramics, and the reason this is done is because your multi-layer ceramics are, have really low ESL and, you know, well, ESR on par with the, the SMD polymers. So, like, normally when, when you know, people think multi-layer ceramics, it's like, oh, they got low ESR. It's not really. Like, you, you can get SP caps. You can get these in, like, 3 milliohm ESR. These normally go to, to around, well, 3 to 5 milliohm ESR as well. So, you know, it, it's not like they're significantly, uh, necessarily significantly lower ESR than, than the large polymers, but they do have significantly lower ESL, and that makes them much better at suppressing uh, higher frequency switching noise coming from the GPU core. Um, and so we've got all of this on the front of the card, but the thing is, this is a Hall of Fame card, and, and it's obviously not enough to, to just load the front of the card with filtering, um, because there's space on the back. So what do you put on the back? More filtering. Um, so we've got even more SP caps and multi-layer ceramics on the back of the card. Um, we've got some extra filtering for the memory up here, which uh, I, I'm i a big fan of that. Um, unfortunately, ooh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this. I'm surprised they managed to squeeze that in there. Though I guess the extended pads on that do allow that, so... Yeah, anyway, because normally this is actually... The, the padding for this is meant for, like, a smaller form factor polymer capacitor, but yeah, you can also smack a bunch of ceramics on it, like Galax has done here. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like, the memory filtering is completely loaded. The interesting thing about the memory filtering on uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and I think this is also applies to... And yeah, I think this mostly applies to AMD GPUs as well, is the uh, add-in board partners aren't actually allowed to really mess with a... I think, I think it's actually a square of the PCB. Like, you're basically not allowed to customize anything in sort of this area. Um, so you can't add extra capacitors, even though there's there might be space. Um, you can't... Like, there, there's a lot of things that you might do want to do to, like, try and improve the, the power delivery. You can't. NVIDIA controls that area. That's, like, you have to use the NVIDIA standard for that. Um, it used to be on older cards, the, the board partners could actually mess around with, with like, the memory trace layout and that kind of thing. As far as I know, that's no longer a thing since, I think, I always think already on the 10 series that, that was, like, NVIDIA just said, nope, you, you are not touching our, our memory system. Um... So, yeah, so unfortunately you can't really, like, like we're not gonna, we, we can't really see, like, you know, some crazy adjustments to the capacitor configuration directly around the memory chips, but, you know, we have some extra bulk capacitance up here. I'm surprised there isn't one hanging out down in this area, though I guess this chip is close enough to this as is. And there is a lot of, like, capacitor pads that, like, these on most cards aren't populated at all. Um, because they're considered optional. They're not necessary for stock operation. But, you know, if, if you're building a, a card with the goal to run the highest possible memory frequencies, then no capa like you're probably going to populate as many capacitors a as you can, right? So that's what's kind of going on with that, because um, there's a lot of cards... Like, th this normally isn't populated, um, and there's a bunch of other capacitors uh, around the card that you'll normally see empty, um, and this card actually fills out. Interesting configuration behind the core itself. Um, 
So if you look at, say, the, the 3090 Strix and the 3090 Kingpin Edition, which are basically the only two competitors for this card, um, yeah, basically the only two competitors for this card, both of those opt to go entirely with multi-layer ceramics behind the core, no, no SP caps whatsoever. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see Galax go with this approach where they have the XP caps. And my theory on one that why they're doing this is actually multi-layer ceramic capacitors, at least the type you normally see for power filtering on GPUs, uh, they are not exactly temperature stable. They are, they're, the priority with their selection is that they have a lot of capacitance, low ESR and low ESL, and the temperature stability isn't necessarily that great. And so the thing is, obviously, if you're pushing a card on liquid nitrogen, well, this whole area of the, uh, on, the on the back of the card is going to get really, really freaking cold. And so potentially the effectiveness of your regular multilayer ceramic capacitors is going to be significantly reduced. On the other hand, uh, polymer capacitors don't care anywhere near as much. They still, you know, have, there are still some effects on polymer capacitors from low temperatures, but they're nowhere near as, uh, as large as what you get on your multilayer ceramics. So that is why I'm guessing that they're, they're using the SP caps right behind the core, because like, it's not a cost saving thing when you've done this. <laughs> Right, like if Gala, like if this was a cost thing, you we wouldn't see all of these multi-layer ceramics right here. They could have very easily just moved that where where the the SP caps are behind the core. But yeah, so I, I'm assuming this is actually like an intentional power delivery optimization, maybe for low temperatures. Um, so yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, sort of difference between this and the the like the Strix and the Kingpin edition that that. Uh, like, I'd love to see oscilloscope shots. Like, I'd really love to see oscilloscope shots of the Hall of Fame against the Kingpin Edition and the Strix, because, like, like I I'm kind of wondering, like, I'd assume that the Kingpin Edition is already hitting sort of the limits of what makes a difference in terms of extra output filtering. Um, and then, of course, Galax just kind of goes like, yeah, so so we're, we're going to just fill all the available empty space with multi-layer ceramics and SP caps. Um 470 microfarad SP caps at that. So these aren't exactly small ones. Um, you know, and, and they, like, they, they've done that on both sides of the card. Um, and then, because you can apparently never have too much, well, it's honestly kind of true, you can never have too much capacitance. Like, well, there is a point where you might start tripping the OCP on the VRM, but that's not a real practical concern. Um, and so, you know, so you have sort of the, the higher free, like, well, mid to high frequency filtering in, in this. And, um, well, this is still going to, like, even the, the, those are 0805 multilayer ceramics, so they still top out in sort of the one megahertz-ish range. Um, yeah, so, so really you would, I guess you would consider that more mid frequency. Um, but then behind that, because you, you can't have too much capacitance, we have all of these through-hole polymers, um, and those are 1,200 microfarads each, which is huge. Um, like, normally through-hole polymers on, on GPUs are going to be like 820 microfarads, and you're probably not even going to see this many of them, and then Galax is like, so, yeah, we're, we're just, just, just all of them. Um, so yeah, I'm a really big fan of what, what Galax always does with the Hall of Fame cards in terms of the, the output filtering configuration. Um, I'm surprised that they didn't do it on both sides. Like, it's really lopsided to this side of the core, right? And obviously, if you've seen the other 3090, 3080 PCB breakdowns I've done, you've got vCork coming in from both sides. You've got MSVDD coming in from both sides. I'm kind of surprised that we don't have the, you know, some extra output filtering over here. But there's a chance that they're not allowed to move the core around too much or something. Like, I, I, like you know, in relation to the PCIe slot, the core has to be located... Well, actually, no. The Strix cards move the core, like, way up the PCB. Um, and yeah, so I, I like... So that... that I, I guess they just ran out of space or something. Because um, I'm, I'm really surprised that they decided to cram all of it over here. Because it really does look like they could have, you know, had like one row on this side and then taken like this part of it and move that over onto this side. And I'm not sure if that would have actually been beneficial. Maybe the way the power planes are designed, it's best to just stack all of the filtering on, on this side of the card anyway. Um, but yeah, like at the same time, you, you can't deny that this is just like all of the filtering. <laughs> So I'd love to see an oscilloscope uh, measurement of this card against like the Kingpin Edition and the and the Strix because 
Um, this should be better, but there's also a point where you reach like very diminishing returns. Um, so you might even have to take the measurement on liquid nitrogen with like a really aggressive overclock before, you know, you start seeing the differences in, in the capabilities of the output filtering on each of the cards. And there's also voltage controller differences between the cards. So that, that might play into it as well, uh, to some extent. So maybe like this actually needs more output filtering than, than the, uh, the Strix and the KPE. Um, just because of the like because of how the voltage controller behaves, but I kind of doubt that because Galax has been doing this on their Hall of Fame cards for years and years and years. It's just kind of like yeah, we're just all the filtering, all of it. Um, and so yeah, th this is one of those things that you know like is is underappreciated I think on the Hall of Fame cards where it's just like all the capacitors, not just some of them, all of them. Um, and so yeah, that that's one of the things I, I've I've always been a been a fan of with with uh, these cards is just like well, cap modding this is gonna be really freaking pointless, <laughs> except maybe the areas where Nvidia go, goes like oh you you can't you know change the capacitor layout around the memory chips, um, and anyway, so yeah that that's the output filtering on this card. Let's talk about the actual uh, you know power stages and and well we're not gonna talk about the inductors. They're inductors. They're they're not that uh, important, um, right? So let's let's do the. We're gonna have to go th to the back of the card because I've managed to forget. Okay, there's a power plane split right there, a power plane split like right here, and then okay, yeah. And on the other side, we've got right the middle one, and then okay. Um, so let's talk power. To, oh, let's talk like let's talk actual current handling capacity. So this down here is memory power. Um, which is pretty normal, like, th you, this is just a normal place for memory VRM to be. Um, then four phases above that, we've got MSVDD, which I like to call Uncore, because that's, uh, like, the, the thing is, um, I think it's, like, memory subsystem VDD or something, and a lot of people think it's, like, memory stuff, but no, it's, like, a second core rail. I'm, I think it mostly powers, like, this bottom section of the GPU core, but I'm not entirely certain. Um, unfortunately, like, I don't have any, any documentation on what, what, what exactly this power, but it's a secondary core power rail. If you look at the lower end, uh, Turing, uh, I mean, Ampere cards, they don't have an MSVDD rail at all because it's not necessary. Um, you don't have, like, like, because the, the cores are smaller, so you don't need a secondary core power rail. It's an interesting way that NVIDIA is doing this, that they, they don't have, like, like, they could have just, I, I'm pretty sure they could have just had, like, a uh, massive V-Core rail instead, and that would have worked just fine. Um, but, uh, but um, yeah, so MSVDD down there. Then all of this above that is V-Core. Then over here, we've got another memory phase. Then over here, we've got um, minor supporting rail that I can't remember the name of. Uh, above, up here, we've got... Actually, wait. I want this to be nice and rectangular. Like, I realigned the entire photo. Can you see? Yeah, I, like, I realigned the entire photo. I'm going to draw my nice rectangles. Come on. So, there we go. So, this top part, VMEM. Then we got a bunch of V-Core that I can't remember where it is. So, we're going to go from the bottom. Oh, wait. Actually, this is nice that they use different power stages for the memory rail, because it makes it really obvious where it is. Anyway, so there's more VMAM, then we've got more MSVDD down here. Um, and then above that, we've got V-Core. So, yeah, that's, that's where, you know, that, that's sort of the power rail distribution around the card, I guess. Um, sorry for hitting the mic. And... Um, What's going on with it, like, the reason why we have this, you know, having the V-Core, and like, V-Core, MSVDD, and the memory VRM scattered all around the board like this, instead of all of it being located on one side of the GPU core, is because this effectively gives you a wider power plane, right? Because you're going to be pushing current, uh, basically down power planes that look like this, in, well, they're probably more like something, well, actually, <laughs> for this, it might look more like that, right? And so you have all this current going into the core, and instead of it all coming from like one side, uh, you effective like you can effectively have something like twice uh, the the cross section of the power plane can be like effectively twice as wide 
because you're going into the, like you're putting power into the core from both sides instead of from one side, which just improves power delivery efficiency. Also because uh, you're, you know, pushing power into the core from both sides, uh, it can lead to slightly better voltage regulation behind the core because what tends to happen with a lot of the really big GPUs, if you have all the power coming in from one side, is you actually get a slightly higher voltage on one edge of the, BG, of the BGA than on the other. So if you went to the back of the card, and I don't know that this is a V-Core capacitor, it might not be. Uh, a lot of the sort of edge capacitors behind NVIDIA BGAs are actually memory power, um, like the actual memory power rail. So that's it, like interesting thing about <laughs> NVIDIA cards um, that, that they have kind of a substantial amount of VDDR going into the core, um, direct, like directly into the core. It's not really, it's not as noticeable on AMD GPUs. Um, and anyway, let's say this is a V-Core capacitor, and let's say there's also a V-Core capacitor right here. Or, well, okay, no, that's that's dumb. Let's say this one and this one. And if you had all of your power going into the core from this side, what would tend to happen is you'd have, say, 1.05 volts over here, and then on this capacitor, you'd have 1.02 volts. Because the current flow, it, like, the amount of current flowing into the core is so high that just over this tiny little distance over here, uh, you actually get like a 30 millivolt voltage drop. And so one side of the core is basically running at a slightly lower voltage. Now, if you push power into the core from both sides, um, your lowest voltage point should be right here. And effectively, instead of having, you know, uh, and the, the because now the current has to travel less distance, that voltage difference should be smaller. So that's another benefit to having this sort of surround power delivery uh, on, on GPU cores, and this is normal for 3090s now, it's just a thing, like, a thing, actually, it's for normal for most high-end GPUs these days, it's just, like, GPUs pull so much power, and they're, they're so hard to power, that, yeah, now, now we do distributed power delivery like that, um, for them, and, uh, where was I going with that, and then we've got a similar thing going on with the memory VRM, and then MSVDD is the same story, Right. It's also part of the reason, like part of the reason why I think it's this lower. Well, if you've ever seen a die shot of a uh, GA102, um, this portion of the chip looks has like significantly looking, significantly different looking structures in it compared to sort of this upper half. And then conveniently, the MSVDD VRM is also on the on the you know lower side of the the GPU core, and it wouldn't really make it make sense to do this with your power delivery, right? Like that's that's weird. So. Anyway, similar idea with MSVDD, you know, push current into the core from both sides, less power loss is better, potentially better voltage regulation. Um, then memory VRM, we've got it scattered all around the board for the same reason, because some memory chips are, you know, closer to some, some phases than others. If you were pushing all of the power into the memory from, say, over here, then this memory chip is going to end up running at a slightly lower or even significantly lower voltage than this memory chip, depending on just how much current the memory chip is pulling and how much, you know, impedance you have in your in your memory power plane. So to avoid that, you can just scatter the memory VRM all around the board, like we have on basically all 3090s, and then each uh, memory chip is, like, the, the distance from the memory VRMs to the memory chips is effectively smaller. And again, you get, you know, a slight benefit in terms of uh, power delivery efficiency as well. So... Um, yeah, but that's all very normal, you know, 3090 things right there. Like the, this, this, this is just Nvidia decided that this is how you're going to do power, dis power delivery on, on 3090s and 3080s. Now, in terms of the voltage controllers on this card, we've got these two chips for the vCore and the MSVDD. I am assuming this one is MSVDD because, well, it's, it's closer to the MSVDD phases. Uh, and this one over here is for vCore. And these two controllers are a Infineon XDPE10281. I'm assuming this is the memory one. Let me just check. Unfortunately, yeah, it's got to be the memory one. This is probably current sensing circuitry. Um, so anyway, um, we've got an X... Wait, I, I can't write. XDPE... Yeah, 10281. Um... And this is a 10-phase voltage controller from Infineon. Um, it's like the young, smaller version of the XDPE132G5C. Um, and this actually came out a while ago. It originally came out for the, the 2080 Ti's and was first used on the 20 Ti, 2080 Ti Hall of Fame. Now, the interesting thing about modern NVIDIA GPUs is that they don't have symmetrical phases. 
Um, so this is a 10-phase controller, but we for vCore, this card actually has 14 power stages, um, which I am not sure where... Let's just put it up here. So vCore um, has a 14 power stage setup. I'm going to zoom in on that. So yeah, we've got port 14 power stages on vCore, and then MSVDD. So MSVDD doesn't do anything weird because it's a much smaller rail, and so you don't need quite so much current handling capacity. So that's just eight power stages, which works just fine because uh, both of those controllers are those uh, XDPE10281s. Um, so we got two of these, um, and yeah, and I'm I'm still I still don't know how Nvidia cards do this. The whole running. 14 power stages off of a 10 phase controller and they do actually run 10 phases quite regularly into a not symmetrical number of number like n well into a not double like not because like, normally you'd expect to have 20 power stages right like that's nice and simple you just run one pwm signal into two power stages at the same time when you have 14 it's like uh so you've got some phases with two power stages in them and some phases with like one and that's kind of weird, but that's been a pretty normal thing for NVIDIA GPUs now for a while. So I I have to assume that this is just some something that the controller just kind of has to deal with in the form of like current balancing, where it intentionally shoves more current through the phases with two power stages instead of, in, instead of the phases with just one power stage each. Um, so yeah, so, you know, just NVIDIA GPU things going on right there. Um, then we've got the 8 power stage MSVDD, that's no problem, right? That just runs 8 out of 10 phase mode, so that doesn't cause any weird issues. Uh, memory power is controlled by a UP9512, which I assume is this chip right over here. Um, and the UP9512 is like the bigger brother of the 9511, it's a bit more digital, it's not fully digital. Um, and, uh, but you can, well, you can get some... Well, this is a Hall of Fame card, so Galax has already, like, I'm, I'm assuming Galax has tools for getting full voltage control on the card that you just have to sort of, that, that you can't access as the general public. But if you're an extreme overclocker and you have one of these, you, you should be able to get the, the uh, voltage control tools for this card. Anyway, this controller, and this is a 9512R, which is actually a reduced size version of the 9512. So normally the 9512 goes all the way up to eight phases, but this is a four phase uh, version. And the thing with the four phase version is, as far as I can tell, it's literally just a case of they shrunk the chip. So there's not, well, they shrunk the package. So there's not enough pins. So you can't, ha you can't access all eight of the phases. Not that that matters because the memory power delivery on this card is of course a four phase setup, right? We've got one memory VRM over here, here, uh, here, and here. So four phase memory power. Which is pretty, which is actually the norm on on 3090s. So that's sort of the control scheme that we have going on. Um, for comparison, the uh, Strix and the Kingpin Edition cards use the Monolithic Power Systems MP2888 for the. Actually, I think they use the MP2888 for all of the rails. Maybe an 8884 for the memory. Um, yeah. So the main difference there is the 2888 is also a 10 phase controller. It's just made by monolithic power systems and it uses a completely, uh, like it uses a different control scheme from all the other controllers. Unfortunately, I don't have any documentation for, for the 10, uh, 10281. So I, I can't really do any comparisons there, but there are like there, there is a difference in the controllers. So, um, you know, like the the thing is, if you were taking oscilloscope measurements, it's not just about your output filtering. Like that plays a big role, but also the way the controller actually handles uh, the VRM and deals with transients can make have a significant effect on the voltage regulation. So that's another sort of like noteworthy difference between the Hall of Fame and the and the Kingpin Edition and the Strix card. Um, though, you know, at the same time, like if if all three of the car, if all the all three of these cards have voltage regulation within a couple millivolts of each other, then the biggest uh, variable for actually who gets the best uh, scores and benchmarks is going to be silicon quality, not voltage regulation, because ten millivolts really doesn't that's really you know do much. If there's bigger voltage regulation differences, then uh, you know th then it would actually sort of be more down to like the PCB would actually have a, a significant effect at that point. And anyway, 
Uh, it, it's just kind of interesting that Galax likes to use the the Infineon controllers instead of the the monolithic power system ones that we see on a lot of the high end 3090s and 3080s. Like it's not just the Strix and the Kingpin edition, but those are like the most. Th those are the only cards that really compare against the Hall of Fame at all. So it's just kind of like yeah. Um, but there's no point discussing like a Founders edition which also uses an MP2888 because it's a freaking Founders edition. It doesn't stand a chance. Um, anyway. Um, so that's the control scheme here. Interesting selection of controllers by Galax. Um, for the power stages, we're looking at a bunch of TDA two, nope, two, one, four, seven, zeros. These are 70 amp smart power stages from Infineon. Um, and the reason these are called smart power stages is because they, uh, integrate very accurate current monitoring. Uh, they also have integrated temperature monitoring, and they have a bunch of safety features like overcurrent protection and over temperature protection and short circuit protection and other safety features that I don't find as interesting, so they're not in my notes and we're not going to talk about them. Um, but anyway, so yeah, they're smart because they have a bunch of extra build, like extra built-in functionality that you don't normally get from regular DR MOS components or, or power stages, and... Uh, they're also ridiculously efficient because, you know, they're rated for 70 amps. Though, funnily enough, even like 60 amp smart power stages are really, 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 really efficient most of the time. You can also get 50 amp smart power stages, which aren't very impressive at all. Um, there is a card that I want to do a PCB breakdown of, mostly because it has a bunch of rectangular power stages that are actually just 50 amps. And, like, my when I first saw that PCB, my hopes went up, and then they very quickly crashed back down when I looked up the part number. Um... Anyway, so, yeah, 70 amps more power stages on vCore, and, of course, more of the same on the MSVDD rail, which means the amount of car, which, you know, combined with the very high power stage count, means that this card can push a lot of current into the GPU core. So, running 1.2, uh, outputting 1.2 volts while running at 400 kilohertz switching frequency, which, uh, Oh, that's another noteworthy thing. So with the 3090s uh, on when, on LN2 overclocking, they, these cards do actually significantly benefit uh, from higher VRM switching frequencies. Unfortunately, the do documentation for the TDA21472 is specced in 400 kilohertz at 1.2 volts, and then I think 600 kilohertz at 1.8 volts. Neither like 1.2 volts, 400 kilohertz is closer to what you'd actually be doing. Um, than, you know, the 1.8 volt 600 kilohertz spec. So, yeah, that's why we're using the 400 kilohertz, uh, even though, you know, you would ba you would almost certainly want to run the, the VRM on this at a higher switching frequency. Not necessarily 1 megahertz, but, you know, because there's a point of diminishing returns again, and if you keep raising the switching frequency, at some point the VRM just gets really, really hot, and if you don't get any benefit in terms of voltage regulation, well, you're just making your card hotter for no good reason. Um, so really, you know, and, and that's another thing where the, the output, like the monster output filter on this card could help is actually you might not need as much switching frequency to hit the same level of voltage regulation. Um, and then of course, if there, if you're, if you haven't hit the point of diminishing returns yet, then you can combine very high switching frequency with an insane output filter for probably some of the best voltage regulation on any 3090 but again you'd you'd want to oscilloscope shots for that and unfortunately i don't have any of these three cards in hand and i'm not sure that there's anybody who has all three that could also like take the measurements um and then another thing is like at ambient because the other consideration is like the cards don't pull as much power at ambient as they pull on ln2 and then of course you have the temperature effect so really you'd want to do the measurements on cold instead of at ambient, because if you take them at ambient, there's a pretty good chance they're all going to look like they perform the same. Um, but anyway, let's talk VRM efficiency. So 1.2 volts, 400 kilohertz switching frequency, 200 amps output. This VRM should be producing somewhere around 16 watts of heat, which is, you know, great efficiency um, right there. Like, you can get lower than that, but the 16 watts at 200 amps, like, that's less than, uh, what is it? And significantly less than two watts per power stage. Um, and basically the reason why I point out two watts per power stage is because uh, to, up to two watts per power stage, you can kind of get away with no heat sinks. Once you start hitting like two watts per compo like per power stage and higher heat outputs, that's when the VRM heat sinks start becoming necessary. So yeah, 200 amps and the VRM efficiency is just, you know, as well, is way up there. Um, 
And the VRM is extremely, is extremely overkill for that kind of current output. Now, 300 amps output, the VRM will start to produce around 24 watts of heat, which is still very manageable, but now you might start to, now you might want to start considering actually having a heat sink. Uh, 400 amps output um, is going to produce about 34 watts of heat. The heat sinks are no longer optional, but it's not like the VRM is going to run particularly hot. And also, um, if you're on, you know, if you're just benchmarking the card, most benchmarks don't run that long. Um, so there's also the factor of like, how long does it take for the VRM before it overheats, right? Like, it, you don't necessarily have to be able to keep the VRM from overheating for more than like four minutes, which is the runtime of whatever, be whatever benchmark it is that you're doing, right? Um, and some benchmarks are even shorter. Some benchmarks finish in like two minutes. And it's like, yeah, so... Um, the, the VRM, uh, like this is straight up the most powerful VRM on a 3090, um, as it does have, like the thing is it's 14 power stages versus like 13 on the other, you know, high end, uh, 3090s like the Strix and the Kingpin edition. So it's not like there's a huge difference, but there is a slight difference. Um, but it really ain't like it's one power stage. It's really not that big. Um, anyway, 500 amps output. And now we're well into LN2 overclocking territory. Or at least so you have to consider, like, a whole 3090 pulls a lot of current, but a very large chunk of that is in the MSVDD rail, right? Like, there, there's a reason why the, the like, l just look at the, the power stage count split. Like, right, this is a 14, that's an 8. And if you look at, like, reference cards, those are normally an 8-5 split, where you have 8 V-Core, 5, uh, 5 MSVDD. If you look at some of the not Hall of Fame custom cards, you're looking at... Uh, you know, 13 V core, 6 MSVDD. So, yeah, like the MSVDD rail, pull is, like, it's a significant amount of power that that needs to handle. Otherwise, it wouldn't have so many power stages in it. Um, un unfortunately, I don't have measurements. I, I really wish I did, but I don't. Um, anyway, 500 amps. Uh, the VRM will be producing about 46 watts of heat. Um, which is still very manageable for benchmarks. Also, you need to consider that that 46 watts of heat is distrib distributed, like, you know, on two sets of uh, uh, power stages on both sides of the core. It's not like you have one massive hotspot. Though, admittedly, you've got an MSVD derail, but normally the MSVD derail doesn't have to run as high voltage. And I'm not sure, like, per power stage, if the pow per power stage current in MSVDD is lower, then MSVDD is just going to end up running cooler than, than V-Core. So... This, like, MSVDD won't necessarily be com contributing significantly to the, the overall VRM temperatures. Um, anyway, 600 amps output. Um, the VRM will produce about 65 watts of heat. And now, th at this point, we get into the territory of, like, you better hope the benchmark is really short. <laughs> Once you start going over, because um, at this point, we're looking at, what is it, like, four... Yeah, that's like over four watts per power stage. So that's when you get into the territory of like, you better have some really nice heat sinks or the benchmark better be really short. One of the two. Um, so anyway, that's the V-Core uh, VRM efficiency. And yeah, it's, you know, more efficient than basically any other 3090 I've seen so far. Um, but not massively so because again, it's, it's the difference between uh, 13 power stages versus 14. Not exactly a huge difference, but it is the most powerful there. Um, then MSVDD, which MSVDD on this card is absolutely massive. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it's all the way up to eight power stages because most of the other cards, you know, they, they go up to six. Um, and then there's this thing where it's like, yeah, we, we got eight. And I'm, eh, I'm not sure what to make of that because, again, I don't know what the MSVDD rail normally has to push in terms of current. Um, but... It certainly doesn't hurt to have a bigger MSVDD rail, right? So, anyway, but the thing is, I don't know how, how important it is that this MSVDD rail is so much more powerful, which I'm kind of annoyed about, but there's not really much I can do about it. Anyway, so also outputting 1.2 volts at uh, 400 kilohertz switching frequency, the VRM will be able to push 100 amps while producing about 8 watts of heat. Um, 200 amps while producing about 11 watts of heat. 300 amps while producing... Wait, what the hell is that? Amps. There, 300 amps uh, while producing about 29 watts of heat. And 
uh, 400 amps while producing about 48 watts of heat. And here, like, the Hall of Fame has a significant efficiency advantage compared to all the other cards, because, like, you know, one, like, going from 13 power stages to 14 power stages, that's, like, a less than 10% increase in, in VRM, like, well, power stage count and therefore sort of current capacity. It doesn't quite work that cleanly, but can kind of think of it that way whereas going from six to eight is a roughly 30 like that's a 33 percent increase in power stage count so that leads to a pretty significant efficiency increase but again i don't know if the msvdd rail like if the msvdd rail even on liquid nitrogen tops out in the 200 amp range the six amp the six phase version is just fine like yeah it runs somewhat warmer than the the eight phase version we have here but it's still fine um so that's kind of the thing. And then the really surprising thing, and this has been a thing on, on plenty of Galax Hall of Fame cards in the past, is the memory VRM. Because that right there, you may notice it's not rectangular. And that, that should already start making some people who've been watching a lot of my videos kind of suspicious. Um, yeah, these are uh, Alpha and Omega Semiconductor AOZ5311NQIs. And uh, these are 50 amp DRMOS parts. They're not very bright. I think they have a thermal warning system, and that's about it. No temperature monitoring, no current monitoring, none of that. Um, and what I find really surprising about it... And well, on one hand, like, if you look back at the history of Hall of Fame cards, this is pretty normal that you'd have just absolutely ridiculous vCore VRM, and, uh, well, the thing is there wasn't an MSVDD rail in the past. You had vCore and you had memory, and that was the two big power rails on, on any NVIDIA GPU for the last several years. So, you know, the, the standard Hall of Fame approach was like you probably, the, the Hall of Fame cards r regularly had the most, like one of the most, if not the most powerful vCore VRMs you could get for any given chip. And then the memory VRM was kind of like, yeah, like way weaker. Like a lot of the time where other cards would be using, you know, power stages, the Hall of Fame would be just like, eh, discrete MOSFETs. Um, and I kind of agree with the approach because the memory normally doesn't really pull that much power. Um, so using a bunch of really nice 70 amp smart power stages is kind of a, kind of pointless. And we can sort of see that also in the, in the controller selection, right? That's a 9512. That's not a particularly, like, it's not as good of, like, it's not as, um, uh, uh, high end a voltage controller as the XDPEs or the monolithic power systems parts. Um, and then similarly, it's just like, and this is literally what you would get on a reference 3090. Like that is exactly the same power stage in the exact same number uh, with, with the exact same number of phases that you would get on a reference 3090, which is, I, I find that kind of surprising because, again, like the, the Strix, the Kingpin edition, they just use the 70 amp smart power stages freaking everywhere, um, at which point that might also just be an optimization of just not having multiple reels of parts on the production line, right? You can just use the 70 amp parts everywhere instead of having to switch between 70 amp and 50 amp parts. Um, but, yeah, so interesting, interesting, you know, like decision there I, i'm like the thing is i also don't have a concrete figure for how much power the gddr6x memory chips pull um but like hall of fame car like the the, the thing is you know it, G galax decided they're upgrading the msvdd they're upgrading the v core to the best v core you can find they've put all this effort into output filtering and I don't think they're skimping on the memory power. Like, yes, this is definitely a cheaper, you know, cheaper power state, uh, like cheaper power components than what the, the 70 amp smart power stages. But I assume they like did the testing and they just came to the conclusion. It makes no freaking difference what you you like, what power stages you use on the memory VRM, um, which would kind of make sense to me because memory chips like the thing is the, the memory on 3090s is notorious for running hot. Yes. But, like, even if, like, if all of the memory chips on the back of the card were pulling, say, 20, may, you know, 20 watts of power, um, and the ones on the front of the card were also pulling 20 watts of power, like, yeah, they'd run hot, because the ones on the back have, like, no cooling, right? Because you have a backplate, there's no active cooling, and... You know, some people, like, the, the, the thing about backplates being used for cooling memory chips is like, yeah, but your, your backplate is, like, literally a flat sheet of metal. In, in terms of surface area, it's not really that different from a bare memory chip on the PCB, except the f part where, you know, the, the backplate, 
admittedly only sinks heat from the memory chips instead of the PCB, which sinks heat, like heat from the VRM leaks into the PCB, heat from the core sinks into the PCB, right? So obviously if you try to cool the memory chips with just the bare PCB itself, well, the, the memory chips are going to be contesting for cooling capacity with the core, with the VRM and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, backplates really aren't, like, they're not really heat sinks, okay? Like, they're flat, so they're not really good. Like, if you've got 20 watts of heat to dissipate, and, the, the like, the, the other thing is, like, the chips can't cool themselves through the PCB because there's more memory chips on the other side as well, right? So, yeah, GDDR6X can run, you know, the back memory chips can run incredibly hot. That doesn't automatically mean they pull a ton of power. Um, because, like... They're not, like, GPUs aren't designed to, like, cool the back of the PCB, like, effectively whatsoever. Also, I'd like to point out that, honestly, double-sided GDDR5 cards also run their back memory chips extremely hot very regularly. That's not, like, basically rear-mounted memory chips, especially in a sandwich configuration, just run hot. That's just kind of what happens when, you know, you put memory chips on the back of the card and then there's no, there's no heatsink for them. Um, so that, that's the thing is like, cause this memory VRM, right? You'd be looking at say, um, in terms of efficiency, damn it. Why doesn't it say what, oh man, I forgot to put it in my notes. What voltage this is at. I'm guessing those power stages are spec'd at one volt and 500 kilohertz. So that's not ideal because the memory runs at 1.35 volts, but it's not going to be that different. So one volt, um, 500 kilohertz. If this is wrong, I'm gonna leave a I'm gonna leave a comment under the video or a note in the description that you know I made a mistake on the 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 rating of the memory VRM. But anyway, where I'm gonna I've I've done worked with these like I've done PCB breakdowns with these power stages before. If I remember correctly, these are one volt, 500 kilohertz on their ratings. So 40 amps output. You know this memory VRM will produce four watts of heat. Uh, 80 amps output. It'll produce eight watts of heat. Um, and, and we've, at this point, we've already hit the, you know, two watts per power, per, per power stage. Um, 120 amps output, um, you're going to be looking at, uh, 14 watts of heat. And then 160 amps output, you're going to be looking at, uh, 26 watts of heat. And the power stage documentation ends at 40 amps, right? Like, yeah, they're 50 amp DR MOS components, but you're not supposed to run 50 amps through them. Similar to how you're not supposed to run 70 amps through 70 amp smart power stages, uh, because the efficiency just jumps off a cliff and like on the power stage manufacturers literally don't rate to the, to the nominal current capacity. Like you don't get an efficiency rating at 70 amps. You get it all the way up to 60 and even at 60, the efficiency is atrocious. So it's like, you shouldn't really be there. Now, obviously a 50 amp part has even lower efficiency at 40 amps than a 70 amp part has at 40 amps, which is why we get the nominal current rating difference. But yeah, like a 50 amp part is not actually like you realistically don't want to be putting 50 amps through it. Like it should like it can do that. You just shouldn't do that. Um, and so the, the thing is, is like, you know, which, which admittedly, if the memory, well, if the memory system was pulling 80 amps, you'd have like 50 watts of heat of memory chips on the back of the card, which is like, I don't think you're cooling that with a plate. Like, the, the backplate wouldn't be able to cool that at all, right? Like, that's like a CPU worth of heat output. Admittedly, split, you know, spread across quite a bit more surface area, but that's, like, still a low-end CPU worth of heat output. Like, that's, like, more than a laptop CPU. Um, and, and, you know, that would be if the entire memory system was pulling 100 watts, like if the VD, the memory power rail was outputting 100 amps into the memory chips, um, which is like, yeah, that's not realistic at all. So um, I, I assume the memory like never goes outside of this current draw range. I wish I had, you know, proof of that, but it wouldn't really like the fact that the memory that the memory chips on on the back don't literally like just up and die instantly <laughs> indicates that they can't actually be pulling that much freaking power because they're they're not being cooled very well right like backplates aren't heat sinks they're rigidity enhancers and you know because nvidia decided that we really need 24 gigs of ram apparently and now they're also being used to cool the memory because the memory runs and doesn't really appreciate running super hot but it's just like 
if you actually wanted to 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 properly handle like there should be like a one slot thick heatsink on the back which would make most cards four slots thick which is like why they didn't do that but yeah anyway so the memory vrm to me honestly makes like like based on the 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 like ba based on my again like it's basically just a guess on my part because again i don't have like per chip power consumption figures um and then also like the the other issue is the actual memory controller itself pulls some amount of memory power from the vmem um yeah i don't know how much power the memory vrm has to actually supply to the card even more so than with with msvdd but it can't be that high because this vrm isn't that big and the memory chips on the on the back of the card can be cool can be kind of mostly kept cool with a you know a sheet of metal which is again not a heatsink so yeah that's that's kind of that so the power delivery on this thing is just insane like um i'm mostly a fan of the output filtering um because <laughs> that that's the thing that makes this card unique to me compared to the other cards because you know the the Strix. We've got 70 amp smart power stages. We got 13 power. We've got 13 power stages. Uh, admi admittedly, the MSVDD rail on this is really substantial. Memory on this is literally reference. Like it's about as reference as it gets. Like even reference cards use this controller for memory power quite regularly. Um, but the output filtering on on here is just ridiculous. V core is you know the most powerful v-core there is but by one power stage msvdd is the most powerful msvdd i've seen admitted by two whole power stages so that's actually a significant difference but yeah so the power delivery on this thing is well the hall of fame treatment you get massive core power and then just kind of like oh the the memory vrm kind of exists because the card wouldn't work without it um but then, then, of course, you get the ridiculous output filtering. And, you know, that, that's the thing is, like, these... I'm assuming these are extra memory filtering, which would normally not be present. And to that extent, um, this cap right here, I'm assuming, is also extra memory filtering. This this is normal. This this is part of the reference design because um, that's inside that, you know, square that you get around the core where it's like nobody gets to touch the component layout in this area. Um, but... Uh, yeah, this right here, this is extra. Um, and then the ones ones up above are extra. So, yeah, I, I'm like I'm a big fan of Ga what Galax has done with the power delivery here. Um, and then we've obviously got some extra extreme overclocking features, like all of the voltage read points up here. Uh, I'm a big fan of the fact that, like, like the, the cool thing about these voltage read points is they're not just like the critical rails that are you know you don't just get v core you don't just get memory power P, uh, pcie power which is one of the minor regulators over in somewhere i don't know where it is i, I keep for well, like i do know well i should know where it is i just don't care enough to remember that that's my awful not a defense uh, you know you've got one 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 uh one point eight volts uh uh measurable but then they've also got your drive voltages so the actual power deal because the thing is smart power stages they don't run off of 12 volts and they don't run off of 3.3 they run off most of them run on five volts so you need a five volt voltage regulator somewhere on the card to power the the the, the to power the smart power stages and um you know if that voltage regulator fails then it's kind of a pain to go find it and so it's really neat that galax basically or if for whatever reason it just shuts down who knows like it doesn't necessarily have to fail like you might have some kind of issue that makes it shut down well galax makes it super easy to actually check it almost every, i think this actually covers every single rail on the card right like you've got your v core you've got your five volts then you've got your msvdd five volts so then you've got your v core v i don't know what this five volt rail is up for that might be for like the no because this doesn't have the usb port so yeah like they have all the supporting rails one one uh one point eight volts is not really a supporting rail that's necessary for the GDDR six X to function, um. So yeah, you've got voltage read points that you know give you everything, and they're in a relatively accessible location. Um. Oops. They're in a you know relatively accessible location. I'm I would have preferred them if they were sort of like on the back edge of the card instead of like where the LN two pot goes, but you know you can always like they are through hole. So you can just stick some wires through them and solder those in and 
you know, you, you'll have your voltage read points. You could probably solder a little connector to that if you want, if you really wanted to, to make them more accessible. So, yeah, that's neat. Um, we've got uh, I square C headers for your voltage controllers if you wanted to hook up an Elmore EVC. I'm not sure which one is the one you'd have to hook up, but yeah, we've, we've got those. Uh, there's dual BIOS functionality. It's an extreme overclocking card. Of course, you get dual BIOS. Um, there's a performance BIOS and a quiet BIOS by default. The more useful use for that switch, in my opinion, is the ability to flash like an unlocked BIOS onto the card. And then over here, we've got this header, which is for a full speed fan button, which is pretty useful if you're testing on air cooling and you don't feel like, you know, fiddling with the fan speed in the software. So you just press the full speed fan button and then the fans always go at full speed. Um, which, this seems like such a minor thing, but I actually really appreciate it. <laughs> a couple cards that I've had with, with the full speed fan button, I, ever since then, I am a fan of the full speed fan button. It's a really, like, it's a nice button for, for testing on, on the stock cooler. So, yeah, we've got triple eight pins. I assume this is power connector indicating, power connection indicating LEDs. Um, so, yeah. That's the, it's the 3090 Hall of Fame. Um, quite possibly the best 3090 there is. I'm, I'm, I won't say with absolute certainty that it is the best 3090. Because, uh, again, like, well, the, the thing is, you know, to some extent, there's the whole silicon quality thing. And then there's also, and, and you know... Well, once you have really good silicon, then yeah, it's all about your power. Like if you have the same silicon on two different, same quality silicon on two different PCBs, then whichever PCB clocks it the highest is the best. But that, you know, like finding two exactly the same capability chips like that's kind of difficult. So it's a hard comparison to make. But this, th this is certainly one of the most impressive 3090s. I, I won't say it's straight up the best because... That is a big statement to make. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, I, I don't really think it could be much better than this. Um, like, the, the, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still, like, I, I still think the f output filter should have maybe been more balanced around both sides of the core, but, eh, probably, like, that probably doesn't make a difference at this point. Um, so... Yeah, that's the that's the 3090 Hall of Fame. Um, it's releasing soon-ish, I think. Um, and yeah, that's it for the video. So uh, thank you to uh, OGS for for sending me the pictures of of the of the card. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual uh, YouTuber merch. Um, there's a link to that down in the description below as well. Both of those help out immensely with running cha the, the channel, so it would be much appreciated if you would check them out. And yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.